Hi, my name is Christopher Ha, and today I'd like to bring attention to Dokdo, a small island off the coast of Korea. Since World War II, Japan has been interested in this Korean island, but in the past few years, their interest has grown. In Japanese classrooms today, students are being taught that Dokdo is Japan's territory. This serious claim has caused controversy amongst not only Korean and Japanese historians, but to citizens around the world. As a high school student interested in world history, I feel that it is important to take a comprehensive and unbiased look at the situation to establish the truth. Dokdo Island is 87 kilometers southeast of the Korean island of Ulungdo and 157 kilometers northwest of the Japanese Oki Islands. Currently, 49 people reside on Dokdo Island. These residents include lighthouse staff, an elderly fishing couple, and the South Korean Coast Guard personnel. The name Dokdo holds insight into the island's history. In 1900, the Chosun government of Korea annexed the island as Hukdo. Sukdo means rock island in Chinese. It was common to use Chinese characters to name an island at the time. However, although the island's official name was Hukdo in government documents, the local people living on the nearby Ulungdo Island called it Dokdo. This is supported by the written activity log of the Japanese warship Nitaka, which came to Ulungdo Island on September 25, 1904, to install telegraph cables. The log states Liancourt Rocks, which was the French name for Dokdo Island, is written as Dokdo by the Koreans. This suggests that Ulungdo's residents were aware of the island and already had a name for it. Where does the name Dokdo come from? Although there is no definitive written evidence for the origin of the name Dokdo, a possible explanation involves the island's topography. There are thousands of small rock islands in Korea, especially along the southern coast of the Cholado province, as you can see in this satellite image. Back then, not every one of these Little Rock Islands had its own name. Many were simply called by a general name, Dolsam by the local people. Dol means rock, and Sam means island in Korean. So Dolsam simply means rock island. But in some Cholado dialects, Dolsam becomes Doksam. So they would have probably called these Little Rock Islands Doksam, according to their local dialect. In 1882, Mr. E. Q. Wan, by the king's order, went to Ulungdo Island to conduct a census. In his Ulungdo report, Mr. E. Q. Wan said that over 80% of Koreans living on the island were from the Cholado province, mostly from the southern coast. How come there are so many Cholado people in Ulungdo? People from the southern coastal region of the Cholado province were skillful sailors. They could have easily come to Ulungdo using their navigation knowledge. They might have come for resources such as special timbers growing on the island and to make use of the rich fishing grounds there. At Ulungdo, they could easily go to Dokdo to fish or to collect abalone. This is the famous giant Dokdo King Abalone, a type of shellfish native to the island. Because the majority of people on Ulungdo Island were Cholado people, it is likely that the Cholado dialect was widely spoken on the island. So when they saw the rock island from Ulungdo, they probably simply called it Doksam, and it is likely that this Doksam became Dokdo in the process of converting it into Chinese characters. How is Dokdo called in Japanese? Japan used to call Dokdo Matsushima, or Pine Island, and Ulungdo Takashima, or Bamboo Island. However, in 1905, Japan suddenly annexed Dokdo as Takashima, using the name of the much bigger island Ulungdo. Why they did this is still a mystery today. Was it a simple mistake? Or did Japan actually want to annex the large Ulungdo Island? We don't know, but one thing we are certain of is that this annexation occurred during Japan's imperial era, when Japan was expanding its territory very aggressively in Asia.
Both Japanese names for the island suggest that there might be some bamboo or pine trees on the island. However, the Korean name suggests rock. The Korean name is a much more accurate depiction of the island, whose surface is just bare rock. There is little to no trees and clearly no pine or bamboo. In fact, when a French whaling ship came close to Dokdo in 1849, they called it Lian Court Rocks. Can any of the trees grow on Dokdo? The rocky surface does not really support the growth of any big trees. Even though Dokdo does not support many plants and trees due to its rocky nature, it used to be inhabited by giant sea lions. Sadly, after Japan took Dokdo in 1905, thousands of Dokdo sea lions were killed by Japanese commercial fishermen, and the number of sea lions declined rapidly. Currently, the species is extinct. Earlier on, I said that there is a worrisome trend in Japan to change history in school textbooks. Let's take a moment to review the current situation. As of 2016, all eight history textbooks used in Japan's middle schools teach Dokdo as Japan's island. This is a dramatic increase from 2011, when only one textbook made this claim. In high school, 8 out of 10 social study textbooks teach Dokdo as Japan's territory. In contrast to recent textbooks, 1939's Japanese textbook Atlas marks Dokdo to be a Korean island. On this map, Japanese land is marked in red, however Dokdo is marked in blue, along with Ulungdo Island and the rest of the Korean peninsula. This indicates that school children at the time learned that Dokdo belonged to Korea. By now, you know Japan annexed Dokdo in 1905, when Japan's imperialism was about to go into full swing. And according to Japanese history, Dokdo was an island with no owner, and was thus annexed as Japanese territory. However, Dokdo had already been claimed. The Chosun government of Korea already annexed the island in 1900, five years earlier. Let's review the situation in more detail. On October 27, 1900, King Kojong of Korea issued Edict No. 41. In it, he established a new county in Gangwon-do province and called it Uldogun. And it was specifically mentioned that Uldogun County administrates Ulungdo, Chukdo, and Sokdo. Because Chukdo is a small island located about 2 kilometers east of Ulungdo, we know well about Ulungdo and Chukdo. Therefore, the other island Sokdo must be current day Dokdo, as no other islands were found around that area. This is further supported by the following event. On March 28, 1906, about a year after Dokdo was annexed by Japan, officials from Japan's Shimane Prefecture came to Ulungdo and visited Uldogun County Magistrate Mr. Shim Hung Tek and they told him that Dokdo had already been incorporated into Japanese territory about a year ago. Shocked to hear this, Mr. Shim submitted a report to the governor of Gangwon-do province the very next day. In his report, he wrote Dokdo, which is under the jurisdiction of this county. Considering the statement in Edict No. 41, Gangwon-do county administrates Ulungdo, Chukdo, and Sakdo. We can tell Dokdo and Mr. Shim's report is indeed Sakdo in the Edict No. 41. This indicates that Dokdo was called in two different names, Sakdo in the government document named based on Chinese characters, and Dokdo by the local people based in the local dialect. Dokdo was another name for Sakdo as there are no other islands in Uldogun County. Also, as I said before, the activity logbook of the Japanese warship Itaka clearly acknowledges the Korean presence on the island by noting that the Lian Court Rocks is written as Dokdo by Korean. That was in 1904, about a year before Japan annexed Dokdo. Let's examine Japan's justification for annexing Dokdo as their territory. When Japan annexed Dokdo into its territory in 1905, they unilaterally declared that Dokdo was an island with no owner. However, in written Korean history, the island has been in the books since the 6th century. 
So let's look at Dokdo in Korean history. But before we talk about Dokdo in Korean history, it is important to understand Dokdo as an affiliate island of the much larger Ulungdo, as it was in the Edict No. 41 of King Kojong. Even today in Korea, Dokdo's administrative address belongs to Ulungdo. Considering that the very name Dokdo is given by Ulungdo's people and their close proximity, it is only natural to think Dokdo as an affiliate island of Ulungdo. Dokdo and Ulungdo are only 87 kilometers apart. When weather is good, you can see Dokdo from Ulungdo with your naked eyes. Therefore, common sense tells us that Dokdo must have been within the daily living experience of the Ulungdo people. I said Dokdo is visible from Ulungdo on a clear day. In fact, in 1454, that was exactly how it was described in a Korean history book. Sejong Shirok Chiriji briefly but accurately describes Ulungdo and Dokdo. It says, there are two islands, Usan and Murung, in the middle of the sea, east of the town of Ulchin. The two islands are not so far apart, you can see the other on a clear day. Can we know what these two islands are? We know that Ulungdo had been sometimes called Murung in Korean history. Therefore, the other island, Usan, has to be current-day Dokdo. Also, Dokdo fits the description because it is visible from Ulungdo only on a clear day. Some people say that Usan Island in Sejong Shirok Chiriji is not Dokdo, but another small island called Chukdo, which is located about two kilometers east of Ulungdo. However, Chukdo does not fit the description of Sejong Shilok Chiriji because it is too close. You can see Chukdo from Ulungdo every day, clear or not. Therefore, Usan in the Sejong Shilok Chiriji has to be the current day Dokdo because there is no other island visible from Ulungdo. Okay, so you know Ulungdo and Dokdo appear in the Korean historical record books, Sejong Shilok Chiriji. What is Sejong Shilok Chiriji? When King Sejong, the fourth king of Choson dynasty, died in 1450, the government of Choson wanted to make an annals for the king just as they did for as the previous kings following this tradition. So after working for two years with all the collections of historical recordings during the king's reign, they published the annals in 1454 under the title Sejong Shilok literally translated as True Records of King Sejong. Sejong Shirok's contents is huge, containing a total of 163 books. Among them, eight books are about humanities and geographical information on 334 towns in all eight provinces of Chosun. These eight books on Sejong Shirok are placed under a separate title, Sejong Shirok Chiriji or Sejong Shirok Geography. So it is in this Sejong Shirok Geography that Ulungdo and Dokdo are clearly described. To me, it is always amazing when I encounter great people in human history. King Sejong is definitely one of them. He was truly a great scholar and a compassionate ruler. Let's take a few minutes to get to know more about him. So, who is King Sejong? He was the fourth king of the Chosun dynasty. He ruled Korea for 32 years from 1418 to 1450 up to his death. Here is his statue in Seoul. When King Sejong was a young boy growing up, he loved reading books so much. One day, his father, King Taejong, worrying about his son's health, had all of his books hid. But of course, it was no use. He kept on reading and reading. His love for books did not stop after he became a king. Here is an interesting episode. There was a bookworm among scholars whose name was Shin Suk Chu. One, might, one night, King Sejong was reading a book in his room and noticed the light was still on in the study hall of the palace. The king was curious and sent an eunuch to find out why the light was still on. Soon, the eunuch returned and said, Shin Suk Chu is still studying there. So pleased to hear this, the king continued on reading. 
time went on, the rooster cried for the first time, the second time in the morning, and finally the light was turned off in the study hall. So King Sejong walked over there and found that Shin Sukju was sleeping, resting his head on the table. With a smile, King Sejong took off his royal robe and covered Shin Sukju's back. When he became the king, Buddhism was a popular and powerful religion in Korea. However, the new king's ruling principle was not based on religion, but based on humanistic ethical teachings. After he became a king, Sejong did not remove his former political rivals from power, which was very rare in those days. During his reign, Sejong shaped the nation's territory to what Korea is now, setting up four forts and six military posts on the northern border to fend off the Jurchen people, who were a nomadic tribe that occupied the regions above the Korean peninsula. Also, he conquered Tsushima Island because it was a hub for pirates. These pirates frequently came to the shores of Korea, Japan, and China. This 14th century painting shows these Wegu pirates robbing villages. However, his true greatness was not in military might, but in his dedication to ethical principles and compassion for his people. He did not discriminate against others and hired government officials from all social castes. As a result, he gained respect from all walks of life, from the highest government officials to the common peasants. Korea entered its most peaceful and prosperous era during his 32-year reign. His achievements are evident in all areas, ranging from science to literature. Many scientific instruments, such as the sun clock, Angbu Ilgu, water clock, Cha Gyuk Lu, the world's first rain gog, Chukugi were invented. Astronomers studied the sky calculating the courses of the seven heavenly objects, the sun, the moon, and the five visible planets within the solar system, creating a celestial globe and developing accurate calendar. King Sejong's desire to help farmers resulted in publishing an agricultural handbook, Nong Sa Jik Sol, which deals with many subjects such as planting, harvesting, and soil treatment. Also, King Sejong was greatly concerned about the social welfare of common people. Orphans and widows were given food, and the disabled and elderly were exempt from taxes. Young men were assigned to take care of such entitled peoples. Even though King Sejong's personal life was struck with tragedies, he did not give up. His daughter and two sons died young. He had to see his beloved queen, Sohan Wong Hu's death as well. And he himself suffered from many health problems due to overworking. Today, many Koreans believe that King Sejong was the greatest king who ever ruled Korea. Sure, he was not a conqueror, like Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan, but I believe that he is, definitely, one of the greatest rulers in human history. In 1443, the 25th year of his reign, he created the current-day Korean alphabet, Hangul. Why did King Sejong create Hangul? Before Hangul, Koreans had a spoken language unique to Koreans, but they were using adopted Chinese characters for writing. Just imagine how inconvenient it would be, speak in one language and write in another. It would be very difficult for uneducated peasants to read and write so only the educated upper class could read and write. This bothered the king greatly. For example, I love you in Korean is 나는 당신을 사랑합니다. Just imagine you say 나는 당신을 사랑합니다 and you write 아에니 in Chinese. Just imagine the whole conversation was entirely written in Chinese. How confusing that would be. What King Sejong was most concerned about was the law. He thought because peasants do not know how to read, they don't understand the law. Therefore, they break the law without even realizing it. And when they get punished unjustly, they cannot appeal because they don't know how to write. So, King Sejong was greatly concerned about this situation. Another reason that motivated the king to create Hangul would be that he was an excellent scholar. 
As a scholar, he would have probably noticed the limitation of the Chinese writing system, as they are most often pictorial representations of the object. So King Sejong wrestled many years to create a new writing system that would be simpler and easier to learn and use. By having an easier written language, all citizens could learn to read and write better. Finally, in 1443, King Sejong created a new beautiful phonetic alphabet made of 28 letters, which he called Hun Min Jung Um, literally translated as Educating People Correct Sound. It appears that King Sejong's alphabet was based on the old Joseon's ancient hieroglyphic text. However, he recreated it into a new phonetic alphabet so that the pronunciation and ligature were more fitting to Korea's spoken language. This shows King Sejong's in-depth academic knowledge in linguistics and ancient texts. These were 28 alphabets King Sejong created, though four became obsolete. This comprises the modern-day Korean language, having 14 consonants and 10 vowels. Consonants are modeled from the shape of sound-producing organs. For example, the five basic consonants center on the mouth. The shape of the tongue that produces gu sound, he created gyeok. From the shape of the tongue that produces un sound, he created nian. From the shape of teeth that produces su sound, he created shiot. From the shape of open lips when mu sound is produced, he created miam. From the shape of an open throat when u sound is produced, he created iung. Out of these five basic consonants, more similar consonants were produced. ku, du, tu, ru, chu, chu, bu, pu, hu. What's so amazing about these consonants is that they group not only according to the appearance of the alphabet, but also to the shape of sound-producing organs. Vowels are made based on the shape of the sky, earth, and humans. By combining the sky and human, he made four basic vowels, a, ya, a, and ya. By combining the sky and earth, he created o, yo, u, and yu. In King Sejong's newly created phonetic alphabet, a variety of words can be made by combining consonants and vowels. For example, by combining nian and a, you get na, and by combining miam and u, you get mu. So, the Korean word for tree, namu, can be written as it is pronounced. Another shocking and almost unbelievable fact about King Sejong's alphabet is that he created it alone, all by himself. He knew that creating an easy writing system will encounter tough opposition from the scholars and upper class castes, because many of them did not want commoners to know how to read and write. Therefore, King Sejong did not seek help from scholars. Instead, he wrestled many years by himself, keeping it under the radar, making it his own secret project, until it was completed in 1443. In fact, when Hangul was finally revealed to scholars, there was tough opposition to it. In February of 1444, about three months after King Sejong finally completed Hangul, a group of seven renowned and established scholars wrote an appeal to the king. They praised that it was an amazing and marvelous achievement by the king. However, they tried to stop the king from making a public announcement about the creation of Hangul. King Sejong, as a result, called them useless vulgar scholars and put them all in jail for one day. And after trying out his new phonetic alphabet for three years, he made an official announcement in 1446 as follows. Because our language is different from that of China, it does not match with Chinese text. Therefore, many of our people have difficulties to communicate in writing. Saddened by this situation, I created a new 28 alphabets so that everyone can learn easily and use it conveniently. Also, King Sejong was an author of several books and wrote many highly regarded literary pieces. One of them is Yong Bi O Chunga, or Songs of Flying Dragons. King Sejong composed it in 1445, 
using his newly created Korean alphabet and published it in 1447, one year after the announcement of the creation of Hangul. The song goes, A tree with deep roots sways not by the wind, blossoms nicely and bears fruit abundantly. The water from a deep spring dries not by a drought, becomes a stream and reaches to the ocean. After his death, one of his ministers, Huang Bo In, wrote about King Sejong as this. From the beginning to the end, the king studied the foundation of government like a scholar. Day and night, with whole heart, he tried to broaden the way to administrate people and showed compassion to the prisoners. The reasons for Hangul's creation and the process of its creation had remained unknown for nearly 500 years. In 1940, a book titled Hun Min Changum Here Bon was discovered, detailing why and how King Sejong created the language. This discovery shocked linguists around the world, as it established Hangul as the only writing system that has a known creator, where, when, why, and how Hangul was created, as well as where and when the language was released to the public. Now back to Dokdo. So, during the reign of the great King Sejong, the historical record book Sejong Shirok accurately describes Ulungdo and Dokdo, saying, There are two islands, Usan and Murung, in the middle of the sea, east of Ulchin. The two islands are not so far apart, you can see the other on a clear day. However, this was not the first time that they appear in Korean history. Historical records during the Shila Kingdom of Korea shows that these two islands back then were a separate state called Usanguk, which was conquered by the Shila in the year 512 AD. After the Shila dynasty, they appear many times in Korean history in different names, such as Urungdo or Murungdo. For example, in the year 930 AD, Urungdo sent tributes to Goryeo's king. Also, from the year 1018 to 1022, Goryeo's king Hyunjong helped Urungdo people who were being attacked by the Jurchen people of Manchuria. You may wonder, are Korean historical records reliable? A unique piece of Korean history is that each dynasty of Korea lasted for a very long time. This is the current day map of Northeast Asia. A long time ago, there was a nation called Chosun in the land encompassing the Korean Peninsula, Liaoning Peninsula, and Manchuria. According to the myth, Huan Ung, a son of the sky god Huan In, wanted to spread Hong Ik Ingan, which means great benefits for all humans. Knowing his desire, the sky god gave three things to his son, a bronze sword, a bronze mirror, and a little bronze bell, and allowed him to come down to earth and rule the human world. Then a tiger and a bear wanted to be human beings. So Huan Ung gave them mugwort and garlic and told them not to go into the sunlight for 100 days. Both the tiger and the bear went into a cave and started praying. However, the tiger soon gave up and ran out, but the bear stayed in the cave eating only mugwort and garlic. And after 21 days, the bear became a woman. She wanted to have a child, but no one would marry her. So, Huan Ung married the woman, and she gave birth to a son whose name was Tan Gun. And Tan Gun founded a nation in the year 2240 BC and called it Chosun. In Korean history, the nation of Chosun appears around the 7th century BC and continues to exist until 108 BC. Soon after Chosun disappeared from Korean history, the four kingdoms were established in the Korean peninsula around the 1st century. Here's the map of these four kingdoms of Korea around 375 AD. There was Goguryeo in the north, Baekje in the southwestern region, the relatively smaller Kaya in the south, and Shila in the southeastern region. Current day Jeju Island was a separate state called Tamlaguk. 
Ulungdo and Dokdo belong to a separate state called Wusanguk. What is so amazing about these four kingdoms of Korea is that all four kingdoms, Goguryeo, Baekje, Kaya, and Shila, lasted for a very long time. Goguryeo lasted 705 years from 37 BC to 668 AD. Baekje lasted 678 years from 18 BC to 660 AD. Kaya lasted 520 years from 42 AD to 562 AD, and Shila lasted for an amazing 992 years from 57 BC to 935 AD. In fact, Shila was the longest lasting dynasty in human history. You may say, how about the Roman Empire? It's true that the Roman Empire lasted longer than Shila as an empire, but not as a dynasty. And after the long-lived Shila dynasty had declined, there came a new Goryeo dynasty on the Korean peninsula in 916 AD. The name Goryeo came from the old Goguryeo dynasty. Goryeo dynasty lasted 456 years until it was overturned by a new Chosun dynasty in 1392. The name Chosun was probably taken from the old Chosun nation founded by Tangun. And the Chosun dynasty lasted 505 years before it was colonized by Imperial Japan in 1910. This table shows a list of major dynasties in three countries in East Asia. As you can see, the dynasties of Korea were stable and lasted much longer compared to our neighboring countries, China and Japan. Goguryeo for 705 years, Baekje for 678, Kaya for 520 years, Shila for 992 years, Goryeo for 456 years, and Chosun for 505 years. For China, the longest dynasties were the Han for 422 years and Tang for 289 years. For Japan, the longest ones were the Henan, for 391 years, and Edo for 265 years. China's Qin lasted 15 years, and Japan's Nagaoka lasted for 9 years. There are some long-lasting dynasties in other countries, such as the Solomonic dynasty of Ethiopia. However, it is very rare for one country to repeatedly produce so many long-lasting dynasties. Why do all Korean dynasties have such longevity? Very often, the history of the nation reflects the mind of the people. I believe that the reason behind Korea's long-lasting dynasties is because of Korea's unique culture of scholarship and respect for history. In fact, the most concern of Korean kings was how would he be recorded in history books. This also explains why Korea never aggressively expanded its territory, invading neighboring countries, as it would be considered unethical, not to mention being permanently recorded as the invader under that king's name. If a Korean king, such as King Sejong, looked towards the lands of Japan and China, people living peacefully, he would never ever think of conquering it. It is because of the very foundation of the first nation of Korea, the old Chosun by Tangun, was based on the humanistic philosophy of Hong Ik In Gan, which means great benefits for all humans. All the kings of Korea honored the nation's founding philosophy, Hong Ik In Gan. Because of the respect for history, Korean kings genuinely wanted to be good rulers for people. Being recorded in history as a good ruler was their ultimate prize and was extremely important to them. They ruled with history in mind. History of the past and the history of the future. People respected the king and no serious revolt occurred to overthrow the government, resulting in long-lasting stable dynasties. Even the most infamous king of the Chosun dynasty, Yan Sangun, once said, the only thing I fear is history. So, let's examine how history was recorded during the Chosun dynasty. What would make powerful kings be nervous about history? History was recorded by history officials called Sagwan. They shadowed the king wherever he went and recorded everything on the spot, good or bad, 
on a daily basis. This detailed daily record is called sacho. When the king dies, annals are made based on all the collections of sacho and other historical records during the king's reign. These annals are called shilok, literally translated as true record. Once shilok is made, all sacho was washed in water to erase the records. Papers are dried and recycled for other purposes. During the Chosun Dynasty, there were eight full-time saguan and about fifty part-time saguan. Therefore, a vast amount of sacho was produced each year, and making shilok was a huge operation, sometimes taking several years. Even though saguan were not high-ranking and high-paying officials, they were proud of their duty and fully aware of the importance of their job. Each one strictly followed the rules for fairness and objectiveness. Once the record was written, it could not be discussed or modified. If a saguan tried to modify or erase a portion of what is already written, he would be executed. If he secretly revealed a portion of written history to someone else, he would still be executed. The rule was so strict; even the king was not allowed to see the records. This was so that the saguan could write the history objectively and truthfully, without being influenced by the king. Chosun Wangjo Shilok, the true record of the Chosun Dynasty, is the collection of all Shilok during Chosun Dynasty of Korea, from the first king to the twenty-fifth king. It comprises of one thousand eight hundred ninety-three books, and is thought to cover the longest continual period, that is, four hundred seventy-two years, of a single dynasty in the world. Each book is about one point seven centimeters thick, so if stacked up, they can reach as high as an eleven-story building. If you read one hundred pages every day, it would take over four years to finish. Recordings of two more kings after the twenty-fifth king Cholchong exist, but are not included in the true records because it was written under the influence of Imperial Japan during the occupation period. Shilok contains almost everything what the nation was experiencing during the king's reign, including politics, economy, society and culture, astronomy, social trends, etc. Even exotic animals such as an elephant, volcanic eruption of Mount Pekdu of Korea, and an appearance of a UFO are recorded in Chosun Wangjo Shilok. The annals of the first three kings of the Chosun Dynasty were handwritten manuscripts. However, for the rest of the twenty-two kings, from the fourth king Sejong onwards, the annals were printed with metal or wooden movable type. This is unprecedented in the making of annals in Asia at that time. Considering cast metal movable type already began to be used in Korea since 1234 A.D., this is not surprising. For example, Chikji in Bibliothèque Nationale de France, or National Library in France, is the oldest book in the world that was printed in metal movable type. It was printed in Korea in 1377, nearly 70 years before Gutenberg's Bibles. The reason for switching from handwritten manuscripts to movable type was because they wanted to make four identical copies of Chosun Wangjo Shilok. They wanted to eliminate any human errors when they made copies by writing with hand. Therefore, movable type was exclusively used for the fourth king onwards. But why did they make four exact copies? Isn't one copy good enough? The main reason they wanted to make four exact copies of Chosun Wangjo Shilok was to safeguard them in case of accidental loss. If one copy is lost, they would still have three extra copies. In fact, each copy was stored in four different cities throughout the nation: one in Chungcheoguan, which is the history library at the king's palace; one in Chungcheo City; one in Chunchu City; and one in Songchu City. When Toyotomi Hideyoshi's Japan invaded Korea in 1592, all repositories were burned down except the one in Chunchu City of Chola Province. It narrowly escaped the destruction due to the heroic action of two local scholars, 
An Ui and Son Hong Rok. When they heard that the Japanese soldiers were approaching, they moved all the books into the Nejang Mountain, using their own money and guarded them. This 1592 invasion from Japan devastated Korea in many ways. It was the first full-fledged invasion from Japan with 160,000 soldiers. This uncivilized, cruel ruler, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, left a permanent negative image about Japan in every Korean's mind, and anti-Japanese sentiment spread wide since then. It was an invasion that cannot be justified in any way. When you see statues of famous rulers of the past, you will find that they are mostly holding the instrument that made them famous. This statue of Toyotomi Hideyoshi in front of Hokoku Shinto Shrine, built in honor of him, shows stark contrast to that of King Sejong in Seoul. This is the city of Kyoto, one of the largest cities in Japan. Here is the Kyoto National Museum, formerly known as the Imperial Museum of Kyoto, alongside the Toyokuni Shinto Shrine, which commemorates the spirit of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. And right across the street from the Shinto Shrine is a strange-looking structure, strange since it has both Korean and Japanese designs. This structure is known as the Ear Tomb Nose Tomb. In the corner of the tomb, there is a signpost explaining the origin of the tomb, written in both Japanese and Korean. Under strange title, Ear Tomb, formerly a Nose Tomb, it says, instead of bringing heads as a trophy, generals of Toyotomi Hideyoshi brought noses of Korean men and women, marinated in salt. They are buried here following Hideyoshi's wish. Apparently, bringing a head was too inconvenient, so they just cut the nose from dead bodies of Koreans, brought them to Japan, and buried approximately 126,000 noses there. It was originally named as Nose Tomb, but was later changed to Ear Tomb by the Japanese to make it sound less cruel. This Nose Tomb was built to celebrate Toyotomi Hideyoshi's victory, who became the favorite hero of Imperial Japan. When Japan was finally defeated and retreated back to Japan after seven years of brutal war, many of Korea's cultural heritages were permanently lost. Among them was Goryeo Wangjo Shirok, which contained 456 years of history of the previous Goryeo dynasty. Fortunately, Choson Wangjo Shilok narrowly escaped destruction, and today, Choson Wangjo Shilok, the true record of the Choson dynasty, is listed in UNESCO's Memory of the World Registry. So far, we have been reviewing Dokdo in Korean history. Let's see how Dokdo appears in Japanese history. Japanese fishermen sometimes came to both Ulungdo and Dokdo Islands for fishing and catching sea lions since the 18th century. Also, there are some 18th and 19th century Japanese maps that include both Ulungdo and Dokdo Islands. Does this mean that these two islands belong to Japan? Putting these two islands on a Japanese map does not automatically mean that they belong to Japan. For example, the 1558 map of Chosun Dynasty clearly shows Tsushima Island of Japan. In fact, Japanese historical records actively deny that Dokdo is Japanese territory up to 1877. The document issued in 1877 by the Daijokan, or Grand Council of State, which was Japan's highest decision-making body during the Meiji Reformation, states it was confirmed that the two islands don't belong to our country. Thus, the Daijokan sent a directive to the Ministry of Home Affairs stating regarding Takashima, or Ulungdo was called as Takashima then, and another island, bear in mind that our country has nothing to do with them. Even though the directive does not mention Dokdo specifically by the name, we can easily deduct that they were Ulungdo and Dokdo because it attached a map which is remarkably similar to a modern map regarding the location of these two islands. The map states the distance between Ulungdo and Dokdo to be about 40 li, 
Li is the traditional unit of length used in East Asia, and the distance between Dokdo and Japan's Oki Islands to be about 80 li. Here is a modern day map. If we superimpose a modern day map to that of the Daijokan directive, we can see how strikingly similar the two are. Therefore, the other island on the Daijokan directive must be Dokdo. It was Japan's honest attempt to make it clear that Ulundo and Dokdo belong to Korea. Japan insisted that these two islands don't belong to our country. Japan has nothing to do with Ulundo and Dokdo. And they attached a map to make it clear what these two islands are. So now we know that Japan clearly stated that Ulundo and Dokdo were not Japanese territories by 1877. However, 28 years later, in 1905, Japan reversed its opinion about Dokdo. They said Dokdo has no owner and annexed it under Japanese territory without even notifying the Korean government. So what happened during that 28-year period? What made Japan change its opinion about the ownership of Dokdo? Imperialism. Yes. Japan was going deep into imperialism during that time. So, let's talk about imperialism briefly. Throughout the 19th century, the West was rapidly industrializing. Such progress resulted in population growth and thus led to the need for more resources. So they turned their eyes abroad and started colonizing foreign countries to collect resources. Of course, colonization was sometimes accompanied with oppressing native peoples, controlling them politically, and often with military means. Let's take a look at the colonization of Asia and Africa towards the end of the 19th century. In 1885, for example, several Western European nations were already occupying Southern Asia. Russia was also advancing into Northeastern Asia as well. In Africa, only coastal lands were occupied by Western European nations by 1885. However, these industrialized European countries soon accelerated the colonization of Africa in a competitive fashion. Britain, France, Spain, there was Germany, Portugal, Italy, and Belgium. Within a 30-year time frame, the entire African continent was colonized except for Liberia and Ethiopia. That is how rapidly Africa was colonized by the industrial West. And they did not leave Asia alone. Great Britain already had control of India since 1757. Using India as a base, British opium was poured into Chinese markets in exchange for silver, making a huge chunk of the Chinese population addicted to opium. The Chinese government was extremely concerned and tried to fight off Britain in 1839. This first opium war lasted for three years, resulting with China as the loser. China also lost the second opium war in 1856. As a result, they were forced to give up more rights to Western powers. China's morale was at an all-time low. Watching China fall to the Western powers, Japan was concerned about its own future. But at the same time, Japan also saw that this was an opportunity to be a superpower in Asia. In 1868, Japan rapidly underwent a series of industrialization processes, the so-called Meiji Reformation. Under the slogan of rich nation, strong military, it was the birth of Imperial Japan. They started to build strong nationalism, reviving a new passion for the native religion Shintoism, building many Shinto shrines throughout the nation, worshipping many spirits, and encouraging people to believe that Japan's emperor was a divine son of heaven. Many were ready to die for him. The controversial Yasukuni Shrine of Tokyo, which became a religious symbol of Japanese imperialism, was built at that time for the spirits of those who died fighting for the emperor. This particular shrine played a significant role for glorifying war during the time of imperial Japan. And even today, 14 Class A World War II war criminals are enshrined here as martyrs. General MacArthur of the U.S. considered destroying this shrine as it cultivates militarism. This photo shows the Yasukuni Shrine in 
1937, at the height of Japanese imperialism. This photo shows Hitler youths visiting the Yasukuni Shrine of 1938. Following the Meiji Reformation, Japan started expanding its territory. 1869, Japan took over Hokkaido. Now, Hokkaido is an island just above Japan's home island, Honshu. Hokkaido is the homeland of the Ainu, the aboriginals of the island. They had their own distinct culture, religion, and language, which are not related to the Japanese. You can see this Ainu man here. As a result of Japan's policy of extinction by assimilation, Ainu people and their language rapidly disappeared. Shockingly, this policy continued until 2007. Only in 2008 did Japan officially recognize the Ainu as one of Japan's indigenous peoples. That was after they and their culture were nearly all gone. Similar to the case of the natives in North America and the aboriginals of Australia, the world suffered a great loss with the annihilation of these rich cultures. 1879, Japan annexed the Ryukyu Kingdom. They were comprised of many islands stretching from the south of Japan to Taiwan. Current day Okinawa was a part of the Ryukyu Kingdom. People of the Ryukyu Kingdom also had their own language and culture. China and the US tried to stop Japan but did not succeed. The Ryukyus had an active diplomatic relationship with China, Korea, and Japan. When the new Chosun dynasty was established in Korea back in 1392, the envoy from the Ryukyu Kingdom was among the first foreign representatives to arrive in Korea. After annexing Hokkaido and the Ryukyu Kingdom, Japan turned its eyes on the Korean Peninsula. But to colonize Korea, Japan first needed to fund off any foreign powers from Korea. So in 1894, Japan declared war with China, thus starting the Sino-Japanese War. Even though the war was between Japan and China, most of the fighting took place in Korea. The following year, in 1895, Japan won the Sino-Japanese War and took Taiwan. This was a significant win for Japan, as it was the first major war they won. It was won over a longtime enemy, China. Winning the war with China greatly emboldened Japan's imperial ambitions. Also, in 1895, another significant event called Ulmi Sabian took place in Korea. A group of Japanese assassins entered Gyeongbokgung Palace and brutally killed the 43-year-old Queen Min of Korea with a samurai sword. The reason was to silence the Queen who wanted to build diplomatic ties with the West. There are many signs that Queen Min wanted to westernize Korea. For example, in 1883, two years before she was murdered, she established English language schools with American instructors. Also in 1883, she sent Mr. Min Young Ik to the U.S. as a special emission. After traveling to many cities and meeting many government officials, including President Chester Arthur, Min Young Ik returned to Seoul and reported to the Queen as follows. I envision a soul of towering buildings filled with Western establishments. Great things lie ahead for this kingdom, great things. We must take action, Your Majesty, without hesitation, to further modernize this still ancient kingdom. Nine years after Japan had defeated China and assassinated Korea's Queen Min, Japan wanted to eliminate another neighboring rival power. This time it was Russia. So in 1904, Japan declared war against Russia. In 1905, while they were still fighting with Russia and apparently winning the war, Japan annexed Dokdo into their Shinema prefecture. Japan claimed Dokdo is an island without an owner. In September 1905, Japan won the Russo-Japanese War and added the southern half of Russia's Sakhalin Island to its territory. At this point, occupation of Korea was only a matter of time. In 1910, five years after Japan annexed Okdo as Japanese territory and winning the war against Russia, Japan colonized the Korean Peninsula. In 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and declared war against the United States of America. By this time, Japan has already invaded and occupied many countries in Asia. 
Comparison of occupied territories during World War II by Nazi Germany and Europe and Imperial Japan and Asia, are, you can see the similarities. Finally, in 1945, the U.S. dropped two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Japan surrenders. However, the emperor never resolved the problem that Japan had brought up upon Korea and other countries. In his surrender speech, Emperor Hirohito continued to justify the war, saying that it was for the stability of East Asia. This is a contradictory statement because according to him, he killed many Koreans to bring stability to Korea. Emperor Hirohito admitted Japan was defeated, but never apologized for all the wrongdoings. He even encouraged people to believe that Japan was a divine land that is imperishable. Therefore, some Japanese continued to believe that their wrongdoings were actually right. This is why this issue is still unsolved to this day. As you can see, Dokdo is annexed as Japanese territory when Japan's imperialism was actively expanding. Therefore, this issue should always be understood in the light of Japanese imperialism. The two issues cannot be separated. This incident shows how easily Dokdo became a victim of Japanese imperialism. In March of 1906, about a year after Japan annexed Dokdo and five months after they won the Russo-Japanese War, about ten officials from Shinema Prefecture of Japan came to visit Ulungdo. When they met Ulungdo's governor, Mr. Shim Hung Tek, they simply told him that Dokdo is now Japan's island. They took a group picture, which is shown here, and left. That's how easily Japan took Dokdo from Korea. Mr. Shim Hung Tech was shocked to hear this, but there was nothing he could do except reporting it to the central government, which had no power to fight back. Since then, Dokdo stayed under Japanese control until it was returned to Korea, when Japan was defeated by the Allied powers at the end of World War II. Besides Dokdo, 35 years of Japanese occupation of the Korean Peninsula from 1910 until 1945 brought tremendous suffering to the Korean people. At all areas, here are a few. Japanization. Imperial Japan enforced a policy of making Koreans into Japanese so that Koreans would be as loyal to the emperor. Japanization included changing Korean last names into Japanese ones and banning the Korean language. This photo shows people in line to register for their Japanized names. About 79% of Koreans adopted new Japanese names. Second is land ownership. Imperial Japan's government in Korea owned 40% of the arable land of Korea. Theft of cultural artifacts. Japan stole about 34,000 cultural artifacts, bringing them to Japan. Even some original copies of Joseon Wangjo Shilok were smuggled out to Japan and had been stored in the Tokyo University until it was returned to Korea in 2006. Forced labor. Imperial Japan put hundreds of thousands of Koreans under forced labor throughout Korea, Japan, Manchuria, and Russia's Sakhalin Island. This photo shows Koreans taken to Sakhalin Island. About 60,000 workers died there. When World War II ended, all Japanese nationals on Sakhalin returned to Japan. However, roughly 43,000 Koreans were trapped on the island because the Japanese government denied their opportunity to return back to Korea. It is estimated that about 22,000 Koreans were also killed by the atomic bombs because they were drafted for work at military industrial factories in both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Comfort Woman The Japanese Imperial Army had many comfort stations such as this. Such working girls were from Korea, China, the Philippines, Burma, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, Indonesia, East Timor, and other Japanese-occupied territories. This comfort station says, for the body and heart. We do not know exact numbers because many victims hesitate to come out due to its sensitive nature. 
One Japanese historian suggests 20,000, but others believe that the number is much higher. In 2014, Pope Francis met with seven former comfort women in South Korea. Compulsory Shinto Shrine Worship According to the Constitution of Imperial Japan, the emperor is divine. During the Japanese occupation, Koreans were forced to adopt the Japanese native religion, Shintoism. Many Shinto shrines were built across Korea, including in schools. My grandmother was an elementary school student at that time in Seoul. She told me that every morning when they came to school, they had to bow before the Shinto shrine at school. Almost every week, students were taken to a pilgrimage trip to a much larger Shinto shrine called Joseon Shingung, built on Nam Mountain, located at the heart of Seoul. They were forced to worship the spirit of Emperor Meiji and other Japanese spirits there. This picture shows current day Nam San Mountain and where Joseon Shingung used to stand. Christians and other religious groups of Korea resisted adopting such Shinto practices. They thus became a target by the brutal Japanese imperial police. Here you can see three Koreans being executed. Many Koreans at that time did not easily grasp what was really going on both domestically and internationally and some cooperated with Japan. However, there are many who wanted to drive out Japan from the Korean peninsula. Some of them fought physically and some of them fought politically. Many of them moved out of Korea to avoid being arrested by the Japanese police. Notable figures of such independence movements include nationalist Kim Gu in Shanghai, the first president of North Korea, Kim Il-sung in Soviet Union, and the first president of South Korea, Lee mm -hmm. Seung-man in America. Of course, many average Koreans resisted Japan's occupation as well. One such a person was a little 16-year-old girl, Yu Guan Sun. She was at her high school in Seoul when the March 1st independence movement suddenly erupted in 1919. It was the largest independence movement since Japan occupied Korea, resulting in approximately 47,000 arrests and 7,500 deaths of Korean people. As her school was forced to be closed, she took a train and went down to her hometown, Chan'an. In Chan'an, she started visiting many churches and religious institutions to explain the situation and plan an independence movement rally in her hometown. Finally, on April 1st, exactly one month after the March 1st movement rally in Seoul, she led a peaceful, non-violent rally in Aune Market Street. She and thousands of participants demanded Japan to return to their country. During the rally, both of her parents were shot to death in front of her, and she was arrested and sentenced to seven years in prison. During the trial, Yu Guan Sun told the judge she is innocent. She said, Japan should be on trial, not me. They invaded my country, therefore they are the criminal, not me. However, a year and a half later, she died in the notorious Imperial Japan's prison, Sade Moon Hyung Mu Seo, in Seoul, due to its extreme tortures. She was just 17 years old. Before she died, Yu Guan Sun said, I am saddened because I have only one life to give for my country. In 2015, the former Prime Minister of Japan, Yukio Hatoyama, visited the prison cell where Yu Guan Sun was held and killed. Brutality of Imperial Japan was not only limited to Korea, but also extended to China. For example, on December 13, 1937, the Tokyo Nichi Nichi newspaper featured two Japanese officers. They were doing a competition in China on who could behead 100 people first. The newspaper reported it as if it were a sports event. The headline goes, Super record in the contest to cut down 100 people. Mukai 106, Noda 105. Both second lieutenants go into extra innings. Both officers supposedly surpassed their goal during the heat of battle, making it impossible to determine which officer had actually won the contest. 
Therefore, they decided to begin another contest with the aim of being 150 kills. Also, one less known secret of Imperial Japan is Unit 731, probably the largest and worst human experiment facility ever created by man. Led by a microbiologist surgeon, General Shiro Ishii, and probably approved by the emperor himself, humans were used as test animals. There was no sense of morality in Unit 731. Most scientists there were proud of their work because they believed they were serving the emperor, their living god. Those who were being killed meant nothing to them. Thousands of men, women, and children were dissected while alive, often without anesthesia, after being infected with various diseases. The victims were Chinese, Koreans, Russians, Mongolians, and U.S. prisoners of war. When test subjects died, their bodies were burned in the crematorium. Located in the remote part of northeastern China, Harbin, Unit 731 was a huge compound, more than 150 buildings over 6 square kilometers, with thousands of scientists and technicians. It was Japan's most technologically advanced biological research facility. This is a picture of the surgeon general Shiro Ishii, the commander of Unit 731. He was a microbiologist and traveled to many Western countries, including Britain, Germany, France, and the United States. He is often compared to Dr. Mengler of Nazi Germany in their ambitions. After World War II, Ishii received immunity from war crime prosecutions in exchange for releasing info on human experimentation to the U.S. The data collected from Unit 731 was deemed as too important to pass up. He didn't serve a single day in prison for what he did and died of natural causes at the age of 67. Some people say that Imperial Japan modernized Korea. Is it true? This is a strange logic, but I guess this is one way to justify Japan's occupation of Korea. It was like, we need to invade your country because your country needs to be modernized. It is true that railways, schools, and buildings were built during the 35 years of occupation, but does this mean Japan modernized Korea? The late 19th to early 20th century was a critically important period for Korea's future. It was during this time that Chosun's king and elite scholars came to realize that Western civilization would be a real change for the nation. I believe Korea would have modernized on its own without Japan's intrusion. For example, in 1882, Chosun Dynasty and the United States signed a Treaty of Peace, Amity, Commerce, and Navigation, or Chomi Suho Chongsang Choyak. This was the first time that the Korean government had opened its doors to the West. The treaty stated, there shall be perpetual peace and friendship between the President of the United States and the King of Chosun, and the citizens and subjects of their respective governments. This treaty was signed in Hwadojin at the city of Incheon. Currently, the place is a special park and museum to commemorate the special event. Another milestone event that indicates Korea was on the way to modernization was that in 1887, five years after the treaty, electricity was introduced to Gunchanggung within Gyeongbokgung Palace by the Edison Electric Light Company from the United States. This was only eight years after Thomas Edison had invented the light bulb. It was an eye-opening celebratory event for the king and all the chosen scholars as they witnessed Thomas Edison's amazing achievement. Ironically, it was at this place, Kun Chung-gun, where Korea's Queen Min was murdered by Japanese assassins in 1895. In 1898, an electric power plant, Han Sung Chung-gi Hwesa, was built in Seoul and the following year in 1899, a streetcar started operating in Seoul for 8 kilometers. Again, all these series of events suggest that Korea's modernization would have been even better without Japan's invasion. 
Now back to Dokdo. What happened after Japan surrendered to America? Does it mention anything about Dokdo? Yes, it does. On January 29th, 1946, the General Headquarters of the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers defined a Japanese territory in a document called Scapin 677. In it, Dokdo was clearly excluded from Japanese territory. What's so significant in this document is that Dokdo was specifically mentioned by name. The third paragraph of Scapin 677 states, For the purpose of this directive, Japan is defined to include the four main islands of Japan, Hokkaido, Honshu, Kyushu, and Shikoku, and the approximately 1,000 smaller adjacent islands, including the Tsushima Islands and the Ryukyu, or Nansei Islands, north of 30 degrees north latitude, excluding Kuchinoshima Island, and excluding a Utsuryo or Ulung Island, the Ancor Rocks, Take Island, and Quell Part, Saishu or Cheju Island. The Ancor Rocks or Take Island is Dokdo. So Dokdo is specifically mentioned to be excluded from Japan's territory. Also, the reference map of Scapin 677 clearly shows Dokdo is excluded from Japanese territory. However, Japan still did not want to give up its intention to keep Dokdo. In 1950, the Korean War broke out and Korea was going through very difficult times. Using this as a leverage, Japan deployed lots of political negotiations with the United States, trying not to give up Dokdo to Korea. And then there came the Treaty of Peace with Japan in 1951. And this Treaty of Peace with Japan is why Japan claims Dokdo as their island today. This Treaty of Peace with Japan, commonly known as the San Francisco Peace Treaty, was signed by 48 nations on September 8, 1951 in San Francisco. Its goal was to officially end Japan's imperial power. However, the main victims of Imperial Japan, namely Korea, Taiwan, and China, were not invited. Also, through this treaty, Japan was supposed to return all occupied territories back to its original owners. Therefore, Japan lobbied hard not to give up territories they annexed during its imperial expansion and World War II period. Japan wanted the treaty to specifically include Tokdo within Japan's territory, which is a very different from General MacArthur's escape in 677. However, in spite of all the political efforts from Japan, the San Francisco Peace Treaty did not mention anything about Tokdo, leaving the Tokdo Island status the same as it was in the escape in 677, which means it is still excluded from Japan's territory. Article 2A of the San Francisco Peace Treaty states, Japan, recognizing the independence of Korea, renounces all rights, titles, and claim to Korea, including the islands of Quellport, Port Hamilton, and Dagalet. Quellport is Jeju Island, Port Hamilton is Kamundo Island, and Dagalet is Ulungdo Island. These three islands are Korean islands, and they were simply used as examples. Just because Dokdo is not mentioned in the article does not mean it automatically belongs to Japan. In fact, there are hundreds of Korean islands that are not mentioned in the article. Does it mean all these Korean islands automatically belong to Japan? No. After the San Francisco Peace Treaty was made, the following year, in 1952, even though Korea was going through difficult times with the Korean War, the president of Korea, Lee Seung-man, declared Korea's sovereignty over Dokdo Island. Today, the South Korean Coast Guard is stationed on the island, having done so since April of 1953. Why would Japan still want to have Dokdo today? First of all, it is very important to acknowledge that there are many Japanese people and scholars who acknowledge that Dokdo's ownership belongs to Korea, as it was confirmed by Scape in 677 and the San Francisco Peace Treaty of 1951. Then, why do we see Dokdo's dispute re-emerging in Japan recently? There could be three main reasons. 
First, some politicians try to use it for their own political advantage and to regain their power and popularity of the citizens of Japan. I only wish politicians would stop using Tokto for the revival of nationalism because they are the leaders of the nation and therefore they have the responsibility to move Japan towards peace and prosperity instead of reliving the days of imperialism. Second, people on Oki Island may feel Tokto was taken away from them by Koreans. It is understandable because during Japan's occupation of Korea, they used to come to Tokto for fishing and hunting sea lions. They probably had some good memories about the island. Now, I have nothing against their memories, but we all need to know that Tokto had returned to the rightful owner by the international community through Scape in 677 and the San Francisco Peace Treaty. Third, to expand Japan's Exclusive Economic Zone, or EEZ. Japan has a vast EEZ, which is the seventh largest in the world. Even though much of Japan's sea territory was acquired during their imperial expansion, unlike the land territory, they did not have to give it up after World War II. Let's take a look at Japan's exclusive economic zone. So here is Japan's exclusive economic zone, and here is Korea's EEZ in blue. This is a shared EEZ between Korea and Japan, this wouldn't be Japan's EEZ if Japan can take Tokto again. Currently, Japan has some islands being disputed with China, and with Russia as well. You may wonder why Japan has their EEZ extending far out to the Pacific Ocean. One example is Okinotori Atoll, which was discovered by Spanish sailor Bernardo de la Torre in 1543. However, in 1931, as Imperial Japan expanded, Japan declared it as Japanese territory, calling it Okinotori Islands. There are a few reef rocks, some the size of grand pianos, barely sticking out above sea level in the atoll. The problem with these rocks is that they are disappearing by natural erosion and rising sea levels. So Japan fortified them with concrete and steel, and now Japan claims an EEZ over 400,000 square kilometers around Okinotori Atoll. This is larger than Japan's entire land area. There were some incidences. In 2014, seven construction workers were killed after a floating pier they were building overturned. Also, in 2016, a Taiwanese fishing boat and its crew were detained by the Japanese Coast Guard for fishing in Japan's self-declared exclusive economic zone around Okinotori Atoll. China, Taiwan, and South Korea all dispute over Japan's EEZ claim around the reef rocks. Korea has always been a peaceful nation with respect towards other nations. History proves it. Throughout its well-documented written history of 2,000 years, Korea has never invaded our neighboring countries. Whenever there was a war with foreign countries, it was always the case that the country was invaded first and drawn into war in defense of the nation. At this point of history, we need to keep in mind that Korea and Japan have a lot of things in common. Korea is Japan's closest neighbor. Also, Koreans and Japanese are the most closely related ethnic groups in Asia, as evidenced by DNA analysis. You can see Korean and Japanese DNA markers are clustered together, indicating they are genetically very closely linked. This close genetic link between Koreans and Japanese is also reflected in their languages as well. Both Korean and Japanese languages show striking similarities in structure as well as in word. In fact, out of all the languages out there, Japanese is the most similar to Korean. For example, who are you in English translates into 당신은 누구입니까? in Korean. You can see who are is placed behind you in Korean. What about Japanese? Japanese is also spoken exactly the same way. Anata wa dare desu ka? You can also see it, there is a special topic marker that are not present in English in both Korean and Japanese languages. Un in Korean and wa in Japanese. 
when your answer is I am a cloud, both Korean and Japanese languages place the verb behind the object. 나는 구름입니다. You can see how similar the word for cloud is. 구름 in Korean and 구모 in Japanese. Striking similarities are also found in many other commonly used words. For example, water is 물 in Korean and 미수 in Japanese. Island is 섬 in Korean and 시마 in Japanese. And bear is 곰 in Korean and 쿠마 in Japanese. This striking similarity of both Korean and Japanese indicates a common origin which I think is probably the old Choson's ancient language. Japanese people still use Chinese characters and had to memorize thousands of words. Personally, I think it would be better for them to adopt Korean alphabet created by King Sejong. In recent years, many archaeological findings suggest that ancient Baekje Kingdom of Korea, whose capital was Seoul for 500 years, made a great deal of cultural influence to ancient Japan. In December of 2001, even the current emperor Akihito announced to the news media that he had Korean ancestry in his bloodline and said that he felt a certain kinship with Korea. History teaches us that we need to encourage cultures, ideas, philosophies, and religions that promote peace rather than violence, helping others rather than hurting others, forgiveness rather than revenge. The founding philosophy of Korea as a nation during the old Joseon dynasty was Hong Ik In Gan, which means great benefits for all humans. Nearly every king of Korea tried to live up to honoring the original philosophy. We cannot forget the past, but the past can be forgivable. It would be wise for Japan to release all claims regarding Dokdo Island to Korea and to acknowledge their past history to ease their relationship with their neighbors. Now is not the time to divide the countries, but to rather unite with mutual respect and friendship. Once such a historical reconciliation is made, I believe that great things lie ahead for the two nations. Korea and Japan should work together tirelessly to bring peace and prosperity to both nations, as well as to all of Asia. I hope that this video was helpful in understanding this issue. If you want, just hit the like button or subscribe button, whichever one. I'm Chris Ha, and I'll see you next time.